Hi there, it's Miss Camp back again with your Harry Potter fix. Um, my special guest today is one of my socks that now you will understand. In the last time we read together, Harry got a special present from Fred George, which was called the Marauder's Map, which is this awesome map of all of Hogwarts that shows secret passages. But the best part is that um, when you look at it, you can also see the people moving around. So Harry knew how not to get caught and went to Hogsmeade. And when he's all done, he says mischief managed and it turned into a regular sheet of parchment. So he just snuck in. Let's see how that goes. Hogsmeade looked like a Christmas card. The little thatched cottages and shops were all covered in a layer of crisp snow. There were holly wreaths on the doors and strings of enchanted candles hanging in the trees. Harry shivered. Unlike the other two, he didn't have his cloak. They headed up the street, heads bowed against the wind, Ron and Hermione shouting through their scarves. That's the post office. Zonkos is up there. We could go up to the Shrieking Shack. Tell you what, said Ron, his che teeth chattering. Shall we go for a butterbeer and the three broomsticks? Harry was more than willing. The wind was fierce and his hands were freezing. So they crossed the road, and in a few minutes, they were entering the tiny town. It was extremely crowded, noisy, warm, and smoky. A curvy sort of woman with a pretty face was serving a bunch of rowdy warlocks up at the bar. That's Madame Rose Marta, said Ron. I'll get the drink, shall I? He added, going slightly red. Harry and Hermione made their way back to the room, where there was a small vacant table between the window and the handsome Christmas tree, which stood next to the fireplace. Ron came back five minutes later, carrying three foaming tankards of butterbeer. Merry Christmas, he said happily, raising his tankard. Harry drank deeply. It was the most delicious thing he'd ever tasted, and seemed to heat every bit of him from the inside. A sudden breeze ruffled his hair. The door of the three broomsticks had opened again. Harry looked over at the rim of his tanker and, and choked. Professor McGonagall and Flitwick had just entered the pub with a flurry of snowflakes, shortly followed by Hagrid, who was deep in conversation with a portly man in a lime green bowler hat and a pinstripe cloak, Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic. In an instant, Ron and Hermione had both placed hands on the top of Harry's head and forced him off his stool and under the table. Dripping with butterbeer and crouching out of sight, Harry clutched his empty tankard and watched the teacher's and Fudge's feet move toward the bar, pause, then walk right toward him. Somewhere above him, Hermione whispered, Mobile Arbus. The Christmas tree behind the table rose a few inches off the ground, drifted sideways, and landed with a soft thump right in front of their table, hiding them from view. Staring through the dense lower branches, Harry saw four sets of legs, chair legs move back from the table right beside theirs. Then he heard the grunts and sighs of the teachers and the minister as they sat down. Next he saw another pair of feet, wearing sparkly turquoise high heels, and he heard a woman's voice. A small gillywater. Mine, said Professor McGonagall's voice. Four points, four pence mule mean. Ta, Rosmara, said Hagrid. A cherry syrup with soda and ice and umbrella? Mmm, said Professor Flitwick, Flitwick, slapping his lips. So you'll be the red currant rum, minister. Thank you, Rosemarta, my dear, said Fudge's voice. Lovely to see you again, I must say. Have one yourself, won't you? Come and join us. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Harry watched the glittering heels march away and back again. His heart was pounding uncomfortably in his throat. Why hadn't it occurred to him that this was the last weekend for the te of term for teachers, too? How long were they going to sit there? He needed time to sneak back into Honeydukes if he wanted to return to school tonight. Hermione's leg gave a nervous twitch next to him. So what brings you to this neck of the woods, minister? Came Madame Rosemarte's voice. Harry saw the lower part of Fudge's thick body twist in a chair, as though he were checking for ears droppers. He said in a quiet voice, What else, my dear, but Sirius Black? I dare say you heard what happened up at the school at Halloween. I did hear a rumor, admitted Madame Rosemarte. Did you tell the whole pub, Hagrid? said Professor McGonagall exasperatedly. Do you think Black's still in the area, Minister? whispered Madame Rosemarta. I'm sure of it, said Fudge shortly. You know that the Dementors have searched my pub twice, said Madame Rosemarta, a slight edge in her voice. Scared all my customers away. It's very bad for business, Minister. Rosemarta, my dear, I don't like them any more than you do, said Fudge uncomfortably. Necessary precaution. Unfortunate, but there you are. I've just met some of them. They're in a fury against Dumbledore. He won't let them inside the castle grounds. I should think not, said Professor McGonagall sharply. How are we supposed to teach with those horrors flying around? Here, here, squeaked tiny Professor Flitwick, whose feet were dangling a foot from the ground. 
All the same, demur demurred Fudge, they are here to protect you all from something much worse. We all know what Black's capable of. Do you know, I still have trouble believing it, said Madame Rose Martha thoughtfully. Of all the people to go over to the dark side, Sirius Black was the last I'd have thought. I mean, I remember when he was a boy at Hogwarts. If you told me then what he was going to become, I'd have said you'd had too much mead. You don't know the half of it, most Rose Marta, said Fudge gruffly. The worst he did isn't widely known. The worst, said Madame Rose Marta, her voice alive with curiosity. Worse than murdering all those poor people, you mean? I certainly do, said Fudge. I can't believe it. What could possibly be worse? You say you remember him at Hogwarts, Rose Marta, muttered Professor McGonagall. Do you remember who his best friend was? Naturally, said Madame Rose Marta with a small laugh. Never saw one without the other, did you? The number of times I had them in here, ooh, they used to make me laugh. Quite a double act, Sirius Black and James Potter. Harry dropped his tankard with a loud thunk. Ron kicked him. Precisely, said Professor McGonagall. Black and Potter, ringleaders of their little gang. Both very bright, of course. Exceptionally bright, in fact. But I don't think we ever had such a pair of trouble makers. I don't know, chuckled Hagrid. Fred and George Weasley could give him a run for her money. You'd have thought Black and Potter were brothers, chimed in Fl Professor Flitwick. Inseparable. Of course they were, said Fredge. Potter trusted Black beyond all his other friends. Nothing changed when they left school. Black was the best man when James married Lily. They named him Godfather to Harry. Harry has no idea, of course. You can imagine how the idea would torment him. Because Black turned out to be in the league with you-know-who, whispered Madame Rose Marta. Worse than that, my dear. Fudge dropped his voice and proceeded in a low sort of rumble. Not many people are aware the Potters knew you-know-who was after them. Dumbledore was, of course, working tirelessly against you-know-who, had a number of useful spies. One of them tipped him off, and he alerted Lily and James at once. He advised them to go into hiding. Well, of course, you-know-who wasn't an easy person to hide from. Dumbledore told them their best chance was the Fidelius charm. How does that work? said Madame Rose Marta, breathless with interest. Professor Flitwick cleared his throat. An immensely compact spell, he said squeakily, involving the magical concealment of a secret inside a single living soul. The information is hidden in a chosen person or secret keeper and is henceforth impossible to find, unless, of course, the secret keeper chooses to divulge it. As long as the secret keeper refused to speak, you know who could search the village for Lily and James, and they were staying years before, before they never found them, never even his nose pressed against the sitting room window. So Black was the Potter's secret keeper, whispered Madame Rose Marta. Naturally, said Professor McGonagall. James Potter told Dumbledore that Black would die rather than tell them where they were, but Black was planning to go into hiding himself. And yet, Dumbledore remained worried. I remember him offering to be the Potter's secret keeper himself. He suspected Black? gasped Madame Rose Marta. He was sure that someone close to the Potters had been keeping you-know-who informed of their movements, said Professor McGonagall darkly. Indeed, he had suspected for some time that someone on their side had turned traitor and was passing a lot of information to you-know-who. But James Potter insisted on using black? He did, said Fudge heavily. And then, barely a week after the Fidelius charms had been performed, Black betrayed them? breathed Madame Rose Marta. He did. Black was tired of being a double agent. He was ready to declare his support openly for you-know-who and he seems to have planned for this moment of the Potter's death. But, as we all know, you know who met his downfall in little Harry Potter. Powers gone, horribly weakened, he fled. And this left Black in a very nasty position indeed. His master had fallen at the very moment when he, Black, had shown his true colors as a traitor. He had no choice but to run for it. Filthy, stinking turn turncoat, Hagrid said so loudly half the bar went quiet. Shh, said Professor McGonagall. I met him growled Hagrid. Must have been the last to see him before he killed all the people. It was me that rescued Harry from Lily and James's house after he was killed. Just got him out of the ruins, poor little thing, with a great splash against his forehead and his parents dead. And Sears Black turns up on that flying motorcycle he used to ride. Never occurred to me what he was doing there. I didn't know he'd been Lily and James's secret keeper. Thought he'd just heard the news that you know who's attack and come to see what to do. While well, shaking he was, and you know what I did? I comforted the murdering traitor, Hagrid roared. Hagrid, please, said Professor McGonagall. Keep your voice down. How was I to know he wasn't upset about Lily and James? It was, you know, who he cared about. 
And he says, give Harry to me, Hagrid. I'm his godfather. I'll look after him. Ha! But I didn't take those orders from Dumbledore, and I told him no. Dumbledore said Harry was to go to his aunt and uncle's. Black argued, but in the end he gave in. Told me he'd take his motorcycle to get Harry there. I won't need it anymore, he says. I should have known something was fishy going on. He loved that motorbike. What was he giving it to me for? He wouldn't need it anymore. Fact was, it was too easy to trace. Dumbledore knew he'd been the Potter secret keeper. Black knew he was going to have to run for it that night. He knew it was a matter of hours before the Ministry of Magic was after him. But what if I'd given Harry to him, eh? I bet he'd have pitched the bike halfway to the sea. His best friend's son. When a wizard goes over to the dark side, there's nothing and no one that matters to him anymore. A long silence followed Hagrid's story. Then, Madame Rose Marta said with some satisfaction, But he didn't manage to disappear, did he? The Ministry of Magic caught up with him the next day. Alas, if only we had, said Fudge bitterly. It was not we who found him. It was little Peter Pettigrew, another of the Potter's friends. Maddened by grief, no doubt, and knowing Black had been the Potter's secret keeper, he went after Black himself. Pettigrew? That little fat boy who was always taking around them after Hogwarts? said Madame Rose Marta. Hero worshipped Black and Potter, said Professor McGonagall. Never quite in their league, talent-wise. It was often rather sharp with him. You can imagine how how I would react now. She sounded as though he should, she's had a sudden head cold. There now, Minerva, said Fudge kindly. Peter Grew died a hero's death. Eyewitnesses, muggles, of course, we wiped their memories later, told us how Peter Grew cornered Black. They said he was sobbing. Lily and James Sirius, how could you? And then he went for his wand. Well, of course, Black was quicker. Blew Peter Pettigrew to smithereens. Professor McGonagall blew her nose and said thickly, Stupid boy, foolish boy, he was always hopeless at dueling. Should have left it to the ministry. I tell you, if I go to Black before little Pettigrew did, I wouldn't have messed around with wands. I'd have ripped him limb to limb, Hagrid growled. You don't know what you're talking about, Hagrid, said Fudge sharply. Nobody but trained hit wizards from the magical law enforcement school squad would have stood a chance against Black once he was cornered. I was junior, junior minister of the Department of Magical Catastrophes at the time, and I was one of the first on the scene after Black murdered all those people. I will never forget. I still dream about it sometimes. A crater in the middle of the street, so deep it cracked the sewer below. Bodies everywhere, muggles screaming, and Black standing there laughing, with what was left of Pe- Pettigrew in front of him. A heap of blood-stained robes and a few, few fragments. Fudge's voice stopped abruptly. There was a sound of five noses being blown. Well, there you have it, Rose Marta, said Fudge thickly. Black was taken away by twenty members of the magical law enforcement squad, and Pettigrew received the Order of Merlin first class, which I think was some comfort to his poor mother. Black's been an Azkaban ever since. Madame Rose Marta let a long sigh. It's true he's mad, Minister. I wish I could say it was, said Fred Fudge slowly. I certainly believe his master's defeat unhinged him for a while. The murder of Pettigrew and all those muggles was the action of a concerned and desperate man. Cruel, pointless. Yet I met Black on my last inspection of Azkaban. You know, most of the prisoners in there sit muttering to themselves in the dark. There's no sense in them. But I was shocked at how normal Black seemed. He spoke quite rationally to me. It was unnerving. You would have thought he was merely bored. Asked if I'd finish with my newspaper. Cool as you please. He said he missed doing the crosswords. Yes, I was astounded at how little effect the the Dementor seemed to be having on him. And he was one of the most heavily guarded in the place, you know. Dementors outside his door day and night. But what do you think he's broken out to do? said Madame Rose Marta. Good gracious, Minister. He isn't trying to rejoin you know who, is he? I dare say that is his er, eventual plan, said Fudge evasively. But we hope to catch Black long before that. I must say... You know who alone and friendless is one thing, but give him back his most devoted servant? I shudder to think how quickly he'll rise again. There was a small clink of glass on wood. Someone had set down their glasses. You know, Cornelius, if you're dining with the headmaster, we better get back up to the castle, said Professor McGonagall. One by one, the pairs of feet in front of Harry took the weight of their owners once more. Hems of cloaks swung out of sight, and Madame Rose Marta's glittering heels disappeared behind the bar. The door of the three boomsticks opened again, and there's another flurry of snow, and the teachers disappeared. Harry? Ron and Hermione's faces appeared under the table. They were both staring at him, lost for words. It's a good spot to start. Tomorrow, we'll start Chapter 11, The Firebolt. Pew!